from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology coming up in the next hour. Tough times at the House of Mouse. New Disney Plus subscribers trailing Netflix by a long shot. Is Disney's streaming service struggling to broaden its appeal after an explosive start? We will discuss. Plus, no stopping for Rivian. The electric truck maker goes public, raising $11.9 billion in the year's biggest IPO. Our exclusive conversation with the company's CEO this hour. And shares of DoorDash hit a record after an earnings beat and an $8 billion deal to buy Finland delivery service Volt. CEO Tony Hsu will tell us how he expects this to hyperscale international growth. All that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets with Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta and U.S. stocks fell by the most in a month. Kriti, paint the picture for us. Well, Emily, stocks taking a little bit of a breather and it all comes down to tech really leading the charge low where a lot of it has to do with big tech, of course. But you can see it spill over into the semiconductors as well, down 2.8%. Even software stocks and electric vehicle makers taking part of the blow. Here's what didn't get dragged down, though, and it's those Chinese ADRs, tech heavy. A lot of it boosted by those 10 cent earnings overnight. Good news in that regulatory backdrop. I want to broaden this out a little bit and macro this just a touch and talk about the S&P 500 and Tesla's role in it in particular because Tesla and we know this EV space has been driving a lot of the gains in the broader index but if you actually look at a terminal chart of Tesla and uh, the current S&P 500 index relative which is what this chart is showing relative to the S&P 500 before Tesla was a part of it you can really see just how much is contributed to the current gains you've seen in the S&P 500 which would explain why part of the stock market's breather right now has a lot to do with that surge in electric vehicle pricing let's go from electric vehicles to cryptocurrencies because that's another place where you have seen a lot of gains and a lot of volatility and another spot where you're also seeing them take a little bit of a breather today bitcoin was actually one of the sole assets in the green today though for crypto stocks in particular that didn't translate over you saw a lot of them get dragged down after coinbase's pretty lackluster earnings yesterday saying we need more volatility for those crypto stocks to really keep up some of those that momentum that's the macro picture emily let's get to the micro with ed ludlow yeah, electric vehicle makers, the story of the day quite clearly. And Rivian's IPO, chief among them. This is the trading action we got on Wednesday. The shares opened at $106 a share around 1 p.m. New York time. And you can see the trading action we got. We don't normally do this on Bloomberg Technology, but this is a snapshot in time. At one point, up towards $120 a share, which is incredible given that the IPO price at $78 a share. We lost a little bit of steam towards the end of the day. Really interesting to see retail traders buy into the Rivian IPO debut of trading. It was the most bought stock on the Fidelity platform with double the buy orders than what Tesla saw on Wednesday, which I thought was astonishing. So where did that leave us? Let's bring up the market capitalization of Rivian. This is a, a company that will make maybe 1,200 vehicles by the end of the year. It has a market capitalization of almost 86 billion dollars on par with General Motors that builds literally millions of vehicles each year. Astonishing to think. And that is the market cap. You think about it on a fully diluted basis, including options and restricted stock, then that gets nearer to 100 billion. So this is a hot one to watch. We're going to talk a little bit more about it later in the show. Some movers in after hours trading on Wednesday, Disney. We've got to talk about this stock. As you can see, down three and a half percent, have been down as much as five percent top and bottom line miss. But what does it come back to, Emily? You talked about it. Subscribers. Subscribers coming in at 2.1 million added in the fiscal fourth quarter. But the street always looking for more after that hot start. A miss on the bottom line. Profit declining, particularly in its film and TV business. Much to discuss. Emily. Right. Ed Ludlow, thanks so much. Kriti Gupta as well. Disney's call underway now. And I hear what Chapek, Bob Chapek, the CEO of Disney, had to say about Disney Plus production. Take a listen. We announced at our last investor day that we expect our total content expense to be between eight and nine billion dollars in fiscal 2024. And we will now be increasing that investment further with the primary driver being more local and regional content. 
That call still happening now. Let's get more on Disney results with CFRA research director and analyst Tuna Amobi, who has a $220 price target on the company. So look, big miss in new subscribers for Disney Plus. Also, uh, the number of new subscribers this quarter trailing Netflix by almost half. What do you make of that? You know, uh, Emily, I think coming into this quarter, uh, Bob uh, JPEG did signal that we're going to have, have this, uh, you know, kind of subdued number. But I think what the street quite underestimated uh, the uh, extent of the, uh, we think the factors that were called out uh, as a result. Um, they talked about the Delta variant impact on supply chain, um, uh, the India uh, Premier League cricket, uh, cricket that was uh, rescheduled, and also the uh, delayed start of Latin America Star Plus. Uh, launch all of those factors. I think uh, the good news is that uh, they're not kind of structural or long-term factors, which is why we expect Emily that this December quarter uh, we're going to see some type of uh, of rebound. But more importantly, I think the target that they've set uh, for fiscal 2024, the midpoint of 245 million. There's nothing today uh, that makes us believe that they're not going to hit that target. But it's a fair comparison when you talk about Netflix uh, and the pace that they, uh, they, they, they're keeping. But remember, it took Netflix almost 10 years to get to their first 100 million. It took Disney Plus less than two years to do that. So if you kind of fast forward, uh, they need to uh, double their subscriber base from where they are today uh, over the next three years, Disney Plus, in order to hit the midpoint of that target, And which is with why we think it's still doable. Right, and Chapek did reiterate that that goal still stands and they are going to get there. They do have some new content coming to Disney Plus this fall, Jungle Cruise, for example, some other films. But I wonder if this shows that the next 100 million subscribers is going to be a lot tougher than the first and more expensive. We expect that to be a lot tougher, and there's no question. And that's true, by the way, for every streamer, right? Um, you, you got the. Uh, uh, the law of large numbers setting. But in the case of Business Plus, remember, they're only in 60 plus countries right now. Uh, and over the next year, that number should uh, ratchet up significantly. They're going to be launching, uh, you know, Asia Pacific markets and Eastern Europe in the next uh, couple of months. And, and I think that as we kind of look out, there is a lot of runway um, for, uh, for, for streamers. And, and uh, you heard um, the clip that you played, um, you know, the investments ratcheting up. Uh, we had the content span about eight, eight and a half billion. Now Bob Chapek seems like he's saying that that number will be increasing, largely due to regional and local content. And those are all factors that help to draw in, um, you know, the uh, the local, the international consumers, where we see a lot of uh, runway ahead. I want to talk quickly about parks. Uh, many more parks now welcoming international guests. Is parks going to be a bigger part of the rebound story, or do you expect that to continue to be slow? There's no question that it's going to be uh, a bigger part of the rebound story, Emily. And we saw that this quarter, returning to operating income, it was quite a relief for the first time in a while. And we also saw that, um, you know, the... Uh, uh, all of the parks, this is the first quarter where all of the parks were fully open for an entire period, which is, again, a positive signal. Uh, but, um, you know, if you've been at the parks lately, you'll see that they have reinstituted a lot of, uh, you know, health and safety protocol. And to our relief, those measures are now facing a lot of pushback. They've got uh, some new technology features now uh, to significantly enhance uh, guest experience. This Disney Genie app has gotten a lot of rave reviews uh, which, thanks to the pandemic, they had a lot of time to work on those. So theme parks, uh, while they're still some ways off from hitting the uh, peak attendance levels pre-pandemic, I think they're moving in the right direction. And we saw the margin uh, also starting to uh, come back. And it's going to take some time to get there, but there's definitely some, uh, you know, some silver lining on the horizon. All right. Tuna Amobi, CFRA, research analyst. Always appreciate your perspective here on the show. Thanks much. Coming up. Shares of electric truck maker Rivian hitting the public markets, raising almost $12 billion in the biggest IPO of the year. We'll hear exclusively from Rivian CEO RJ Skarinch about what is next and the challenges on the road ahead. That's next. This is Bloomberg. I would say the biggest challenge uh, that we have, and I would say broadly across many industries, um, is, is really the health of the supply chain.
That's Rivian ringing in the company's public debut, the largest IPO of the year and the sixth largest ever in the United States. Shares rising as much as 47%, pushing the electric truck maker's value past traditional automakers like Ford and GM, topping EV rival Lucid. For more on the path to the public markets, our own Ed Ludlow spoke with Rivian CEO RJ Scaringe in an exclusive interview. We spent years and years putting this together. And really what's so exciting is seeing such a diverse group of people with diverse backgrounds and, and interests really coming together uh, to create these products. And, and you know, standing there today, looking out at the team as, as we rang the bell, uh, it was quite emotional, you know, seeing, seeing so many passionate faces. It was, it was really powerful. So we're, we're excited. And it, of course, this is the first step of, of many uh, with us you know, becoming a public company and, and now having the opportunity to really accelerate uh, a lot of our areas of focus in terms of scaling the impact that we can have with our products and, and with what we're building. How critical has Amazon been to the various valuations the company's been assigned along the way, the credibility that Rev Rivian's been able to build? Well, Amazon's been a, uh, just an outstanding partner. Uh, of course, they're a major shareholder. Uh, but aside from that, and, and I would say uh, much more important than that, is the collaborative relationship we have with them. And in the vehicles that we're developing on the commercial side, uh, what you see on the surface is, is a really friendly, easy to get in and out of, uh, very efficient, very easy to load and unload, a van that's optimized around last mile and has a whole host of applications. But what you don't see is all the infrastructure that we're building around that, what we call our fleet OS platform, uh, but essentially the, the ecosystem of services that we're able to wrap around the vehicle to make it very efficient to run and to be able to work closely with Amazon and, and understanding what the needs are for us to build that system has, has just been awesome. It's been, it's been really exciting and um, you know, working um, to understand how do, we, how do we find opportunities for efficiency, but also how do we make the environment for the drivers and the operators really comfortable uh, and something that they want to come into. So you've raised $10.5 billion in the private markets, I guess around $12 billion in the public markets. What are you going to spend that money on? <laughs> but I, I think as, as you look at the scale of what has to happen as, um, as an industry, today there's, there's well over a billion vehicles on the planet. A teeny fraction of those are electric. And really over the next 10 to 15 years, we have to electrify that entire fleet. We have to replace you know, well in excess of a billion vehicles, gasoline and you know, combustion powered vehicles uh, with electric vehicles. So the scale of this is just, it's, it's in some ways unimaginably large. And it, it's gonna require multiple companies to be building multiple products, you know, portfolios of products that, that capture addressable market in different form factors, different segments. And for us, we're very focused on that. So what we're, right. you know, what we're looking at today is, is our launch products, but making sure we have the capital to continue scaling the business, building additional production capacity for future products, uh, you know, continuing the development of those future products along with the technologies is really key and, and we are really striving to help drive and lead uh, this, this massive transition that we're gonna have to right. see over the next 10 to 15 years. Bloomberg's reported you're in talks with the city of Fort Worth to invest $5 billion in a plant there. You're looking at potential sites for a plant in Europe, potentially the UK. What's the update on those, please? We, we haven't made any announcements around our second facilities, uh, second or third facilities. There, there's certainly a lot of uh, speculation but it's, these are really important decisions. And, and for us, it really comes down to looking at the, the, the ability to recruit an outstanding team to come in and, and help drive and operate these, these facilities. So looking at the, the pool of talent that exists in each of these locations, these potential locations, as well as of course, the access to the supply chain. Uh, so where our suppliers are and, and what the logistics looks like to bring, uh, bring components in. On the supply chain, you delayed the start of production on the R1T more than once. You know, you talked about a shortage of semiconductors. Where are the pressure points? Is it in semiconductors, rising commodity costs, labor? Where are you seeing the choke points? I would say the biggest challenge uh, that we have, and I would say broadly across many industries, um, is, is really the health of the supply chain. And, you know, if you think about building a vehicle uh, like this, like our R1T, there's around 2,000 parts that come in from end item parts that come from suppliers. And, this is one of those rare situations where a 99.5% is not good enough. Meaning if 99.5% you know, of the, the supply chain is ramping at the same rate of our production, but 0.5% isn't, 
that of course constraints, uh, creates a constraint or a throttle for how fast we can ramp the rest of the facility. And that's certainly the world that we're living in along with many others of, of managing what is actually a small number of suppliers, but, but working really close with them, partnering with those, those organizations to make sure they can, they can keep up with our ramp. And that is a, that is a major focus of our team. And uh, we're fortunate to have some great folks that are on the ground working with those suppliers, uh, you know, making sure we get right. through this ramp phase. Our very own Ed Ludlow there, an exclusive interview with Rivian CEO, RJ Skorinch. Coming up, DoorDash going global. Shares in the food delivery giant jumping on a deal to buy a European delivery app. I'll talk next with DoorDash CEO Tony Shu about what it all means and how food shortages are impacting the business. That's next. This is Bloomberg. A surprise deal from DoorDash, the food delivery giant buying Volt, a Finnish food delivery startup for $8 billion in an all-stock deal. It is one of the largest mergers of a Finland-based company ever, according to Bloomberg. I spoke earlier with DoorDash CEO Tony Shu about what this means for the company's international growth. I'm super excited about the Volt partnership. Um, you know, for us, it really represents wholly our long-term investment in building a global business. In Volt, we really see you know, three amazing things coming together for us. One, it's a team that shares our vision for transforming local commerce. Uh, and they also share the way we operate in you know, competing on building superior products, um, you know, caring about taking every ounce of inefficiency out of the system and, and, and really building something for all stakeholders. You know, second, it's a business that has an incredible runway for growth. Um, you know, they're at two and a half billion dollars of gross order value annualized today with attractive unit economics, largely because of their superb retention. Um, but when you combine that capital efficiency with just how much runway is left in their markets, there's, this business will scale you know, for a long um, time on its own. And the final thing is, you know, this partnership really gives us the intentional focus and it accelerates our ability to operate across multiple geographies in a hyper local you know, context. Now, they also deliver more than food. They deliver cosmetics and electronics. Looking out into the future, how big a piece of the DoorDash pie do you see non-food delivery being? Well, like DoorDash, I mean, the vision was always to transform all of local commerce for Volt. I mean, Volt's mission is to you know, make life in cities better. And they plan on doing that by bringing every physical business, whether it's the local butcher shop, the local grocer, um, you know, flower shops, you know, cosmetic stores, convenience stores, certainly restaurants, you know, and, and bring all of that online. And, and that really fits very well with the DoorDash mission, which is to transform physical businesses um, and help them compete. And the way we do that is by, you know, building the largest local commerce app, the DoorDash app to bring incremental demand. And also by building the largest local commerce platform where we're giving merchants the same tools we've built for ourselves, products like DoorDash Drive and Storefront to help them build their own digital businesses. So I think, you know, an increasing part of the portfolio will certainly come out of restaurants. I mean, as you saw in the third quarter results that we announced just uh, yesterday, you know, now 12% of our monthly active users are now shopping outside of the restaurants category. That's up from single digit percentages just at the beginning of this year. There are supply shortages of almost everything around the world, including food. And I'm curious, are you seeing prices rise on menus? And how is all of this impacting DoorDash? Yeah, you know, I think one of the um, um, things that's playing out right now in the macro economy is it, it, while governments around the world, I think absolutely might, made the right decisions um, to inject money into the system and and really you know prevent a global recession um, in the middle of a global pandemic. You know some of the consequences now are only you know playing out. It's it, it's it certainly wasn't obvious and and wasn't you know probably even possible to predict all of the consequences that would have happened from some of those actions. Um, but you, we are seeing rising prices as you as you're discussing. Um, that's happening in supply chain, so impacting you know grocery stores, impacting convenience stores. 
um, other types of retailers. Um, we're seeing some of that happen, obviously, in the restaurant um, space as labor is tight um, and, and, and labor costs are rising. So we're certainly seeing um, you know, some of those inflationary pressures. Um, I, I think what's what I'm hopeful and, and optimistic about is that you know governments, alongside with business, will work together and actually address these issues. You know, I think we certainly did the right thing of preventing um, a global recession. Now we have to do the right thing and actually confront some of these um, you know consequences to mitigate these trade-offs. We're seeing driver supply issues continue to challenge Uber and Lyft. And you know, often after I do an interview with either you or Dara at Uber or even Fiji at Instacart, I hear from drivers who say. We're still not paid enough. How has Dasher supply been impacted through the pandemic, and what trends are you seeing now? We're actually seeing pretty healthy levels of you know Dasher supply. Over three million Dashers earned over two point eight billion dollars in the third quarter, and you know I think what you're seeing is it really goes to speak to just how complementary the Dasher work is in terms of earning flex flexible earnings opportunities. Um, alongside traditional work. You know, uh, the vast majority of dashers, um, over 90% of them dash fewer than 10 hours a week, and that's because um, the, the vast majority of them actually have full-time jobs, and so they really see this as supplemental earnings opportunities. And, and we're very, very proud of the earnings that they've seen. I mean, not only are they billions of dollars, you know, in the third quarter, but they've actually gone up, you know, 30 percent um, uh, year on year. And, and, and it's it, dashers are earning nationwide, you know, between 24, 25 dollars um, in, in which they're delivering. Now, you disclosed Dash Pass subscribers for the first time this year. They almost doubled from five million to nine million. Um, and I'm curious how that's impacting order volume and frequency and basket sizes. Well, Dash Pass has been a big driver, I, I, I think, of the um, you know value on on, on DoorDash. And um, as as you know, we shared in our shareholder letter, um, you know, Dash Pass membership has grown you know sequ sequentially every quarter. Um, it's certainly grown year on year, and it's um, really shown that, especially as DoorDash is you know giving back more literal value in the form of a greater affordability, it's also giving value to uh, customers as we're allowing customers to uh, dash pass members to order from more categories such as convenience grocery liquor and other retailers um, at the same dash pass membership price and so we're adding more value to the program and as a result I think we're seeing um, consumers um, you know continuously shop more and more and more um, as part of dash pass DoorDash co-founder and CEO there Tony Shu. Still to come, we're going to find out about DoorDashes and how their booming deliveries are impacting my next guest, CEO of Marquetta. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's get back to the markets with our own Kriti Gupta. Kriti, what are you watching now? Well, Emily, let's just start off with those streaming wars because they were all the rage in 2020. You had these major companies, Disney, Netflix, really rivaling uh, each other to try to get the end subscriber. And now look at what we're doing here year to date. A lot of those uh, streaming services are actually lower, except for Netflix, a lot of that coming from Squid Games. And this is actually not including the drop you saw in Disney after hours. So tomorrow this chart will be even uh, harder to look at. But streaming wars, really something you want to keep in mind, given that in 2020, that was the major pandemic pandemic trade, these big tech companies, especially because a lot of people were at home watching movies, watching shows. This year, not so much. This was really kind of suffering from that reopening trade. I want to go from streaming wars into cryptocurrencies because this is another spot that's kind of had a little bit of a rough ride. I want to compare this to Bitcoin's pretty monster rally, 121% year to date, hitting, hitting that 68,000 level in intraday trading today. And with it in year to date, taking some of those crypto stocks, the exception, of course, being Robinhood, which really hasn't been able to grasp some of those crypto gains despite a lot of their actually end revenue coming from those crypto users coinbase even with uh today's and yesterday's say the after hours drop yesterday and today really citing that lack of volatility in third quarter still up 31 percent year to date of course it is after all still the bitcoin miners that are reaping the most gains up uh 114 percent using riot blockchain as a pro as a 
proxy for all the miners. But Emily, I think you'll get my get my point here. I want to switch from cryptocurrencies to payment firms because this is another spot that actually hasn't been having a ton of luck this year. And this was all the rage once again in 2020 when we're talking about using digital cards, debit cards, for example, using Venmo accounts. A lot of that has to do with just being contactless. And now in 2021, as more people go out, you start to see companies like PayPal, like Wex actually underperform year to date. The question is, how do they keep diversifying? How do they keep working with uh, other payment companies like Affirm, like Square to keep that momentum going and perhaps pull them out of this, uh, this little tough time they seem to be having, Emily? All right, Gritty, thanks so much. I want to keep the conversation going on the world of fintech and Marketa, the payment platform that helps companies like DoorDash, Uber, and Instacart process their payments just reported its third quarter results revenue jumping more than 50%. The stock actually way up after hours. The CEO of Marketa, Jason Gardner, with us now. So, Jason, what was the most significant driver of today's results? Hey, Emily, thanks for having me. Good to see you again. Uh, we just seen continued sustained growth. We had 56% uh, growth quarter over quarter from last year. We saw, again, massive growth in buy now, pay later. Uh, we're continuing to see uh, big growth in our non-top five customers. Um, so we've reported that we saw a reduction from 72% in concentration in Square down to 68%. And that truly shows the power of our platform. So we see where our customers like Square are using lots of different surface area and we're continuing to grow around the world. I just spoke with one of your big customers, Tony Shu, the CEO of DoorDash. You also work with Instacart, you work with a firm, and I'm curious how the supply chain challenges that seem to be crippling networks around the world are trickling down to you and your customers. So we, we do see, uh, and I think we've all seen the experience of how the supply chain is affecting the market, but people still need to pay for things, uh, whether it's consumers paying merchants, uh, whether it's consumers paying consumers, uh, we're still core to monarch card issuing and the business there. So as we continue to grow, whether it's creating the gateway for Coinbase card holders to spend at the point of sale, um, we are continuing to grow the business uh, in, in this face of the global supply chain issues. You clearly see a future in crypto. Talk to us about progress there and what the next step for Marketa is. So we purpose build our solutions. Uh, we purpose build for crypto, uh, whether it's Coinbase, Fold, Backed, uh, ShakePay. Um, we create the ability for people to spend their cryptocurrency balance at the point of sale by creating that gateway. So when a card is swiped at the point of sale, we send a message to Coinbase. They look at the cardholder's balance in crypto, uh, then convert that crypto to uh, an amount, uh, which then converts to fiat currency at the point of sale. So you can't technically spend crypto at the point of sale we have created a way or a gateway to make sure that happens. So we're seeing great growth there. I'm a big believer in crypto, a big believer in blockchain. You and I have talked about this many times. We're going to see a lot more to, to come. You also said the last time we spoke pretty matter of factly that crypto is going to get regulated. You know, when do you see that happening and what will the impact on Marketa and you know, markets across uh, the world actually be? So regulation is good. Uh, regulation of crypto is good. Um, I just came off a couple of weeks ago from Money 2020. I know you've been there before yourself, which is sort of the preeminent conference around everything fintech. Uh, a lot of talk around decentralized finance and crypto and blockchains. Also AML and compliance, which compliance and crypto actually fit together pretty well. So I would draft off of that in regards to, to regulation as well. That goes into a place of trust and verify. Uh, we see a bright future in regards to crypto, uh, also decentralized finance as we begin to, to grow the business there. Uh, but again, Visa and MasterCard have interconnected the world uh, for companies that want to accept cards. Uh, there is a lot of growth there uh, in the modern card issuing alone. However, you clearly have seen us dip our toes into cryptocurrency and, and blockchain. All right, well, we'll keep watching where those toes go. Jason Gardner, founder and CEO of Marketa, thanks so much. For stopping by. Coming up, a call to action to save the planet. We're going to speak with longtime venture capitalist and chair of Kleiner Perkins, John Doerr, about his new book, Speed and Scale, and what he believes is the path out 
of the climate crisis. And as we head to break, let's take a look at shares of Bumble, the dating app raising its revenue forecast for the rest of the year, a sign maybe that the easing of pandemic restrictions has brought new enthusiasm for matchmaking. We're gonna find out more about it when Bumble CEO Whitney Wolf Heard joins us Thursday right here on Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg. As we near the end of COP26 in Glasgow, much has been said about what we need to do to address climate change urgently. And one of the most promising trends toward cutting carbon emissions is the unprecedented shift of corporate financial decisions from fossil fuel to clean energy. Venture capitalist and chair of Kleiner Perkins, John Doerr, has been leading Silicon Valley's clean tech movement since 2006. And his new book, Speed and Scale, dives into how we can reach net zero global emissions by 2050. John joins us now. John, wonderful to have you back on the show. Your daughter, I understand, actually inspired you to write this book. What did she say that sparked you to action? Well, this all started 15 years ago after we watched Al Gore's movie. You remember An Inconvenient Truth. Well, Mary Dorr was an inconvenient youth because at, <laughs> at dinner that evening, uh, we went around and said, how do people react to it? Mary said to me, Dad, I'm scared and I'm angry. Your generation created this problem. You better fix it. And I was speechless. The room went silent. I, honestly, I didn't know what to do. And so partners of mine and I decided to learn more about the climate crisis. And as you know, we traveled the world, visited labs. We went to the Amazon, to China. Uh, we started investing. And over the course of three funds, invested a billion dollars in some 70 or so ventures. Many of them failed. It was really hard. And in fact, some gave up, said we should give up. We, we stood by those entrepreneurs and today their shares are worth some $3 billion. But more than the money, companies like Beyond Meat or QuantumScape have really set a course to drive others to take action in meat without meatless proteins and, and better batteries, as an example. But what I know now is it's very clear. We're on the verge of a catastrophic and irreversible climate crisis, and so we've got to act. And more than anything else, what we need is a plan. Okay. Let's talk about that plan because you have one. Um, everyone talking about reaching net zero by 2050. How are we going to do it? Well, it turns out there's six big buckets of opportunity to reduce 59 gigatons of emissions to net zero by 2050 or sooner. And, and, and those six simply are to electrify our transportation, clean up our grid with solar and wind, to fix our food systems, to protect nature, and, and, and then to uh, clean up the industrial processes like cement and manufacturing. With those five, we can remove 49 of the 59 gigatons of emissions. And there, there's a fifth cat sixth category where we clean up the stubborn remaining carbon. For each of those big objectives, Emily, we have a handful of key results, OKR style, the way Google or Andy Grove would do them. And this whole plan, it's available for free. It's on the website speedandscale.com. So you can download it, print it out, and get some sense of the magnitude of the transformation that we've got to go through to pull this off. Now, you came to clean tech many years before many other venture capitalists, and as you said, many companies failed. At this point, do you still feel like you have something to prove there? Oh, I think we have something to prove every day, all the time. But the, 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 the climate, <laughs> no pun intended, has really shifted in that regard. When we started, there was maybe two or three billion dollars per year of venture capital invested in clean tech. This year, the estimates are it'll be 10 times that amount, say some 30 billion dollars. Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, he's, he's, he said he thinks there'll be 
a thousand unicorns in climate tech. So uh, the in investor sentiment has changed both for venture and also for institutional investors. There's an institutional investor alliance of some $150 trillion of portfolio capital that said they want to see their dollars aligned with net zero enterprises. So this, the, the corporate sector, the investing sector, the entrepreneurial sector, they're all leading the rest of the world. It's our governments and political leaders that are reflecting public opinion and lagging. So you spoke to many business leaders, including Larry Fink, as you mentioned, Bill Gates, Sundar Pichai, Jeff Bezos. I want to talk a little bit more about Jeff Bezos and Amazon, given their climate footprint. How can they be more a part of the solution? Well, they're a major part of the solution already. They've pledged that their operations, their supply chain will be net zero by 2040. That's 10 years ahead of the, of, of the Paris goal. And then they've reached out to other businesses to sign them up for the climate pledge is what it's called. E easily as impressive to me is that Jeff Bezos has committed $10 billion to climate philanthropy. And that makes him the largest climate philanthropist in the world. So look, everywhere we turn, we need more ambition and more urgency. But uh, Amazon's helping to set the pace. What about Google? Google's also made some pretty bold targets. Google was very early in matching all of its electricity usage with the purchase of renewables. They've done the boldest thing of all. And, and that's to say they intend by 2030 to have all of their energy needs directly supplied by renewables. So no offsets, no greenwashing. They're going to use solar, thermal, geothermal energy so that every Google query you ask about can be powered with renewable energy. They're also building a wide range of tools for municipalities to do planning of their transit systems and for even individuals now on Google Maps to choose the most uh, climate friendly path to get something done. So what are your big takeaways from COP26? You know, are you seeing more business as usual and is enough really being done at a global level? Well, when Greta Thunberg says COP26 is a lot of blah, 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 she has a point. The point is pledges are fine. What we really need is action and follow through. I'm very impressed by what the COP conference agreed to do around methane emissions. Uh, I'm also, uh, it's important that COP is not over yet. Just today, the U.S. and China did something really worth noting, and they issued a memorandum of cooperation, which identified five areas in which the U.S. and China are going to cooperate beyond what's in the, the current pledges and agreements. So uh, I, I think the current plans do not get us far enough, but mm. they should make us hopeful. Hopefully there will be less blah, 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 as you say. Now, I have to ask you, you have seen so many cycles of innovation in Silicon Valley. What do you think is going to define venture capital investing and tech growth for the next decade of post-pandemic Silicon Valley? Well, I, I believe there are huge tsunamis, as I think you know, the first of which was the microchip in the PC, the second of which was the internet, the third of which was mobile and cloud at about the same time. We've entered the fourth wave, and my belief is that it is the combination of the pervasive reach of AI technologies and the economic imperative of the climate crisis. I think climate will be the largest economic opportunity of the 21st century and technology will play a really important role. John Doerr, chair of Kleiner Perkins, out with this new book, Speed and Scale. Wonderful to have you, John. Thank you for joining us. Coming up, Rivian's big IPO. We're going to dive deeper into today's debut on the NASDAQ and the future of the electric car market next. And the Disney's earnings call has wrapped. During the call, CEO Bob Chapek sharing news about what audiences can expect to see soon on Disney+. This is Bloomberg. Marvel's Eternals 
Aquas has reached more than $161 million at the global box office in less than a week. And Disney's Encanto, which premieres in theaters on November 24th, will come to the service after their exclusive theatrical run. We continue to watch. Zillow has agreed to sell about 2,000 properties from the home flipping business that it is winding down. Bloomberg has learned that New York based investment firm Pretium Partners will buy these homes. Pretium owns more than 70,000 rental homes across the United States. That makes it the country's second largest single family landlord behind Invitation Homes. And I want to wrap this up by taking a final look at Rivian's roaring stock market debut, the biggest global listing of the year. Let's bring back our Ed Ludlow and Crystal Z, who covers IPOs for us. So, uh, Ed, obviously, you know, huge scoop for you, exclusive interview with RJ Scaringe today. What's your big takeaway as someone who's been covering the company for a really long time? And by the way, his very first interview before they had pictures of anything they were working on was right here on Bloomberg Technology. Right. I remember it, August 2018, when they kind of said, oh, we have this skateboard design for battery technology for EVs. And then they turn around and go, just kidding, it's a pickup truck. Um, you know, Investors have been following this clo company closely for a long time. Over the course of many years through the private markets, they attracted $10.5 billion of investment from big Wall Street names. It wasn't just Amazon. It wasn't just Ford. And those investors came along for the ride. You saw many of them commit to this IPO. And what was so crazy about the trade on Wednesday was the retail investor interest as well. You know, what is it that Rivian does? They have a battery electric pickup. What do Americans love? They love pickups. You know, these two things are a match made in heaven as far as the electrification story goes. Crystal, what do you make of the response from investors today? What's the big takeaway? I think it's really interesting looking at uh, the relationship of Ford because at the end of the day, it, uh, Rivian's valuation was as about $88 billion, which made it a bigger car maker than Ford is and for being one of the investors. And I think what Ed mentioned, retail investors, was a really interesting component because 0.4% uh, of the deal was allocated to retail investors. And as we all know, retail investors love to chase deals. Uh, even though that was a small amount, um, that really kind of reflected in the early days of trading where stocks were up uh, and it touches the uh, 100 billion club very, very briefly. But what is interesting is also that it's at the year end and overall this year IPO haven't done as well as the indexes. So you see a lot of fun, um, mutual funds, portfolio managers trying to really capture alpha at the fourth quarter of the year, which also make this deals an extra bit more attractive. So all of that, we saw a very interesting day of debut from Marian today. All right, love this video of RJ Scaringe's children ringing the bell at the NASDAQ. Ed, look, the company now has a bigger market cap than GM and Ford, though well behind Tesla. Could Rivian shape up to be a, a, a bigger competitor to Tesla? Yeah, it's really interesting, you know, going into this listing and you see the kind of drama with the, the price action we got on Wednesday. At one point, shares hitting $120 almost. Uh, you know, th th these are big numbers for a company that's built very few vehicles and will build maybe 1,200 by year end. But, but investors all talk about Amazon, the Amazon effect, the Jeff Bezos effect. It's not just that Amazon's an investor, it's that they have this order for 100,000 electric delivery vans. And it's a point of differentiation that Rivian has over Tesla currently. And also, you know, it's very visible revenue. The street can look at that and say, $5 billion of sales for, for electric vans. We see what the pathway forward is here. Crystal, talk to us about investors here, you know, Ford, Amazon, big investors. What does that say about the future of the company? Yeah, I think what Ed said is really, it's really important because automaker really rely on contracts. And if I learn anything about uh, anything this week is if you announce something with a contract like Hertz with Tesla, it's going to do something to your stock. So um, it, it would be really interesting to see when those trucks get delivered. But I would also point out that the deal had a very, very heavy allocation towards cornerstone investors. So on top of the investors such as uh, Amazon and Ford, 
people like Blackstone are also getting a big chunk of the deal. They took up up to five billion of the transaction. So the deal itself looks like it's a hundred, it's an eleven billion deal, but in fact it's much smaller, and that's why the demand is that much more uh, intense. And Ed, quickly, how do you expect demand to evolve? Given that you know a lot of people, you can't get it yet, but then once it does come out, w will there be another wave, if you will? Yeah, look, this is a supply constrained business. Demand will exceed their ability to build these trucks for years, literally years and years. There's a concern from Wall Street that this truck costs $70,000. And even though it fits the category of what people want to buy, there's only so much addressable market out there that's willing to pay that level. Whereas if you look at Tesla, their vehicles are slightly more affordable. There's a bigger mass market appeal. So if there is some concern in the marketplace, it's that perhaps Rivian has a ceiling on what it can actually sell each year. But again, it has a point of differentiation in its commercial vehicles. All right, Bloomberg's own Ed Ludlow and Crystal Z. Lots to continue to watch. Thank you both. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure you tune in tomorrow when we'll be joined by Bumble CEO Whitney Wolf Hurd and SoFi's Anthony Noto. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.